Republicans and a weekly press conference. It's day 22 of the legislative session. We're happy that you're all here. Uh, we're excited about seeing some bills go across the floor and move over to the other body. Um, we've had um, some good discussions and working really well with the House Democrats on process and moving things um, from our body to their body. I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll make our 90-day uh, limit and be out of here in 90 days. So I want to thank the House Democrats for working with us. I appreciate it very much. Um, with me today, I have Representative Johnston, Representative Wilson, and Representative Kopp. And uh, we're here to take your questions. And we'll start with um, opening questions, our opening comments. And Jennifer, would you like to start? Yes, thank you. Um, yesterday was a very interesting day. Um, we had a discussion as far as funding the, the school formulas program, and I'm very pleased that it passed the House. Um, the, the disagreement was the fund source. Um, I, I respect particularly um, Representative Tuck's comments on the floor because the funding source really was a, a political discussion versus a budgeting discussion. And I think what the Representative Tuck was trying to do is see if there was a way we could do a CBR vote early and if this strategy would work as far as us um, getting to the end game. It was something that I couldn't agree with because um, to me uh, um, the Constitutional Budget Reserve is a fund that's used for cash flow and it's also used to, for the budget gaps. And so since we don't know at this point what the budget gaps are, um, I would hate to prematurely um, take funds from the CBR and not have the funds there for cash flow and not and maybe even overfund a budget or actually underfund it. We don't know. We're not there yet. But there are funds in the general fund to fund school funding. And I'm very happy that we passed that. Um, it says, should send a message to our school districts that we do believe in taking care of our children. And um, I can't wait to see what the Senate does with it. Great. Representative Cobb, good morning. Yes, good morning. It is uh, good to see the um, bipartisan support for early funding of education. Um, I'm also excited to be working um, with uh, Representative Matt Clayton on a, um, a violence in the workplace bill against health care workers that just uh, passed unanimously out of judiciary and is now in House rules. Uh, I think we're seeing um, a number of, of tracks where our uh, two sides are working together, similar goals, uh, protecting Alaskans' public safety, getting a budget together that works, and ad advancing the interests of all Alaskans. Um, education is a real big thing for me this year, being part of the Alaska Education Challenge workforce, and I'll be speaking to the Alaska Association of School Boards this weekend about state tribal compacting, and some opportunities we have to really look at some of our very low, uh, long, long uh, standing uh, test scores in rural areas of Alaska and how we can turn that around, move the state forward. We have some uh, great opportunities this year for success, and I believe we're going to get across the finish line in several of them. Thank you. Thank you. And Representative Wilson. Thank you. Um, I guess I saw yesterday being a little different than others did. It seemed like a lot of the other side really didn't know where the money was coming from, and that is really concerning when the budget is the best, is what we're looking for. So the amendment, which I truly appreciated, that the revenue that we know that's going to be coming in, that we want to use it for education versus a CBR that maybe this year might be there, probably won't be there next year. I just don't know why we would set that kind of precedence. And so I do appreciate that. That's why I voted no on the bill is because taking it from the CBR was not, for me, the right choice um, to go. But then, you know, we did the senior benefits. And what was interesting about that, then the general fund did have enough money in it. And we just heard from the co-chair there was no money in it. So it just doesn't make any sense when you have those who are helping you with the budget. It doesn't even seem to understand where our revenue goes, how that is different from the Constitutional Budget Reserve, which we actually have to take money from our revenue, put it into the Constitutional Budget Reserve. It doesn't go there automatically. And then we have our separate account of the earnings reserve. And my concern is that I guess I'm not as optimistic on the 90 days because we spent a lot of time on a bill that if we got done in 90 days was not even necessary. We're only meeting one time a, a day in, in finance and spending little to no time even in subcommittee. And if we're serious about really getting a sustainable budget, we have to utilize our time a lot better down here. 
Representative Johnston? Um, yes, because there was some concern or uh, confusion as far as cash flow and, and how it works, I actually worked with my office to come up with a flow chart, and I'd be glad to hand this out um, because it, it can be confusing. And um, I have enough for anybody that's interested. Thank you. And now we'll take questions. And if you could just say your name and your affiliation, we'd be happy to um, answer all of your questions today. James. Uh, James Brooks from the Juno Empire. Wanted to ask you all, uh, what use is 287 without a funding source right now, without a confirmed funding source, I just should say? Mr. Wilson? I think what 287 does say is, you know, this is the amount of money on the BSA on transportation, on how the legislature wants to fund it. Not having a funding source at this point, it had a July 1st date, so nothing was going to happen before July 1st. The other part is we make, you know, monthly and sometimes quarterly payments um, as we go along. So I think it's sending the message of we're not looking to reduce it by 5% or 10%, some of the things that I know have been talked about in the past, but that you could look for this amount to come, and then as we get the budget done, the funding source will come along with it. And, and to that point, it is funded. There are funds av available in the general fund to fund this. And so we're saying this is our first priority for those general fund dollars. Um, one of, How are you saying that? Because we supported the bill. We said we strongly believe, or, and almost all of us, in education. And so we're saying in the budget process, this is our priority. This is where the general funds go first to the, school, to the kids. But there's nothing in that bill that prioritizes it above a, a later budget bill for every other department. No, no. what it is is an appropriation bill. Yeah. And, we, and if you don't put in the Constitutional Budget Reserve being put in there because it takes another vote, it automatically goes back to the general fund. Mm -hmm. So th it's, no, it's funded. It is funded in the budget process. I, I mean, in fact, it, it, it was concerning to me last night. I heard on, on one of the stations that they said that it passed without funding, and that's, that's not true. There are funds available. We said we support education. So the first funding out of the budget, out of the general fund, goes to education. And as the budget, the finance committees, and each body then goes to put together a budget. Um, we'll see where all the other funds go and then where our budget gaps are. But no matter what, we did an appropriation bill that said we will fund the BSA and the transport formula. So I, I you know, it's, I don't know how, how much clearer we can get. But as I said, I, I'd be glad to share this to sort of show you the process. The, the, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the other aspect of this, and I was trying to explain this on the floor, is how the school funding formula works. And it is a quarterly payment to the education trust fund. And out of that education trust fund, um, after the school districts present their budget on July 15th, they get monthly allotments. So it's the, it's a quarterly payment from the general fund to the education fund and a monthly payment to the school districts. So as you appropriate, you don't need the money up front. This is, this is something that goes over through the year. And it's what happens in the final quarter is each school district is trued up to their actual amount. So it's, it's, it's not something that you'd put, we never put all the money in the education trust fund in July 1st. It's, it's not the process, and I don't think it would be great, it wouldn't be good cash management to do it that way. But we did pass an appropriation bill yesterday. So James, the traditional funding source has always been the general fund, so we're following tradition. There's no reason at this point to go right to the CBR. We continue the traditional funding for our education budget as we've done in the past every year going forward. Um, Steve Quinn with KTVA. I've got a follow up for Representative Johnston and then a uh, separate question for Representative Cobb. Uh, so, are you saying that if the Senate passes 287 as is, then it's automatically the general fund? And, and the only reason I actually did the amendment 
um, yesterday was that I thought if we amended it first that we could maybe even show unanimous support for the bill. And as you heard from Representative Wilson, she couldn't vote for it because she didn't believe in the, the fund source. Um, so that's, it's, yes, it's an appropriation bill. Just like what we just did with the senior <laughs> benefits. That's an appropriation bill. Representative Cobb, can you please uh, tell me a little bit about what, what drove your um, violence in the hospital uh, bill your, that you co-sponsored with um, Representative Clayman? Sure, Steve, that's a great question. Um, some of you probably remember back about 10 years ago, you know, there was a real violent incident down at Central Principal Hospital. Um, it, there was a, a serious incident that took place in the workplace down there, and that's, that's an extreme situation. Um, workplace violence in the hospitals has been a rising tide um, that has just flooded our emergency rooms and healthcare facilities, not only around the state, but around the nation. If you just Google hospital workplace violence, you will see that um, many states are wrestling with this issue of what goes on with um, workplace safety once um, uh, patients, uh, people accompanying them, um, go through the emergency room doors. It was reported to us by the Alaska State Hospital Nurses Association and the Alaska Nurses Association over the interim that healthcare workers are being seriously assaulted, um, strangled with IV tubes, um, have their t teeth chipped, you know, um, noses broken, um, um, real, real serious assaults. But because you are in an emergency room, there, there has almost been developed a culture where this is your job, it's a tough job, you know, uh, you know get through it. And it's interesting, if that happens right outside the emergency room door, if a police officer or if a firefighter um, is, is hit, it's assault, right? Even if you're alcoholed up, even if you're drugged up, there is not an excuse for that. You're not adjudicated criminally insane because you were under the influence. And even if you have a severe behavioral health issue, the standard is very high to be considered not criminally liable for your actions. Healthcare workers have said right now, for a low-level misdemeanor assault, the law requires an arrest warrant. So what happens is when we report being hit, punched, stabbed, grabbed, thrown to the floor, they will show up, officer will show up, and if they didn't witness it, because on a misdemeanor level assault, it either has to occur in your presence or the person who has been assaulted has to sign a sworn affidavit basically affecting a citizen's arrest, saying I am placing you under arrest and here's the probable cause statement. Well, healthcare providers say it's hard for us to take off our patient first hat and put on our prosecutor's hat and prosecute our own case. Like, we want to take care of people. We want the police to be able to show up, have the tools to interview folks. If probable cause exists for the arrest, affect the arrest, make the workplace safe for us because every other patient in the facility needs to know that they're safe, that chaos isn't continuing to happen, and most importantly, the workers there taking care of the people. If they're distracted in a violent incident, they're not taking care of every other patient they're supposed to be watching. So that is balanced with the healthcare professional is required to say the person is stable for discharge. If it was somebody that was presenting for treatment, they won't let them go unless they are stable for discharge. And the bill says further that if the assault is a felony level assault involving serious physical injury, then that is an aggravator at sentencing. So it, they can be given additional time because it was directed against a health care provider and a health care facility. It,